was born 87 years ago. For 65 wow. years, I've ruled Less than 10 seconds in, and I'm already regretting this. But for all I, uh... <laughs> I've never been I'll admit, actually, I, I swore to myself first that I would never do any I streaming of Final Fantasy games or Bethesda games, no specifically because the long-form JRPG or the uh, the open-world experience just seemed to not fit very well into an episodic uh, format. However, the first game I ever attempted to stream was Oblivion. It was this very long, extensive art project I had conceived of called We Was Adra primarily dedicated to a couple of things. First and foremost, the idea of the anti-stream, combining both the stream and the tutorial to create something that would question the very nature of streaming. Now, uh, the previous project I did before, I, um, I, I thought about airing it. Uh, it seemed out of the three Elder Scrolls games that were readily available that this was the most sensible one to do. Uh, but it was more than that. It, it was uh, combining multimedia with the streaming experience. From a gameplay perspective, I will be building a min-maxed uh, power leveling character. Uh, basically gaming the leveling system uh, for your amusement. Of course, that's not really amusing. Uh, so in, in addition to that, I decided I would find a way to dedicate this to a, a figure in history, in American history, that holds my interest in particular, the father of American survivalism, Kurt Saxon. Now, I'll explain a few things about this before moving forward, but let's uh, let's take care of the character first. Now, it's funny, I, um, I had a friend uh, ask me one time uh, various questions. What's your favorite Elder Scrolls game? Morrowind, of course. And uh, what do you usually play as? And when I told him what I usually played as, he, uh, <laughs> he told me I was a terrible player. And yeah, the worst kind of gamer, I think, was the exact... Uh, the exact terminology. And you know what? That's fair. Now let's just see what we can do with this. Good God, each one looks more alien than the one before. I know this, this, I, I know that Oblivion is, is particularly, oh God, is that, God, it's the baby face of like a Midwestern housewife. This will do very nicely. Uh, let's see here. I, I know that there were better graphics at the time. For whatever reason, this is what they settled on, and we're gonna let them. We're just gonna let them accept that. Uh, we don't really have a choice, do we? Kurt Saxon is a very interesting character because he was someone I learned about. Uh, I would say sometime in 2013. There we go. Uh, I learned about him in 2013, and he is quite an interesting character. And I'll be telling you more about him as the story continues. Uh, but for the express purposes of our pilot adventure, I'll just explain how things work. Now, you're probably going to notice that on the side of the screen you can see me. Pretty soon I'm going to disappear. I'm going to fade away from here, and I'll be replaced by Mr. Kurt Saxon. That's him, uh, down there, in the bottom bottom right hand of the corner of the screen. That's right. That giant black bar wasn't just going to be wasted space the whole time. <laughs> Fancy. Uh, now, uh, along with Kurt Saxon's show, there will be other multimedia footage that I've included. Uh, that'll appear here, in the uh, top right hand side of the screen. This will usually tie in thematically, or uh, maybe fit in with what's going on in each episode. Uh, maybe it'll have something to do with uh, what Mr. Saxon's talking about in that episode uh, for his opening monologue. After that, he takes callers, and the callers will be represented by uh, mostly still images, maybe video clips. Uh, this is a reboot of the original version, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a little fun with it. Wow, is that the wow? That that is a booty shimmy right there. Is that we're sure that's not subliminal? Yeah, fine. I'm against the wall. What else do you want? Just do we just like spread eagle and spread them? Anyways, so I'm already getting distracted. So yes, that'll be the format. We'll have the collars up on the top right hand side, and we'll have Mr. Saxon on the bottom right hand side. 
Now, for the express purposes of the first episode, we're going to skip all of this because everyone knows the story. We all know the story. There is no need for us to learn about the story uh, on this adventure. Yeah, blah de blah de blah Your Majesty, just get out of my house! You're standing in the hole where I take poops! Get out of my house! Sorry, everyone. I got a little distracted there for a second. But yes, uh, we're going to have a very fun adventure. Uh, learning about Kurt Saxon and his uh, radio show that he had in the early 90s that broadcast on AM radio. Uh, each episode will take a little uh, trip uh, down memory lane with one of his, um, let's say, better episodes. Uh, I'm a fan, but they do get a bit repetitive sometimes. And uh, some of them are, uh, well, more a sales pitch than anything else. But for the first episode, I wanted to start with a bang. Uh, something that would really catch people's attention. And what would be better than the fiction that he wrote? Yes, he wasn't just a survivalist and a militiaman. He was also an avid fiction author. And he wrote a series of stories starring a schizophrenic vigilante who would go out and do crazy, inadvisable things that we do not in any way endorse on this stream. We don't encourage violence on the stream. Uh, mostly because it's just not going to do any good. You're just going to waste your time and probably give nothing but good ammunition in the, in the culture war for your enemies. Better to, uh, better to just not be involved in that way, right? Right, exactly. So, without further ado... Let's enjoy the first episode of Kurt Saxon's show. Now, unfortunately, I, I don't have uh, every single story uh, that he wrote. There's only this one. Now, uh, there I do have it on, in print. I could potentially uh, do my own reading of them for another episode at some point, uh, should that become of interest to anyone. Uh, and, and furthermore... Uh, what, what? God, I forgot. Also, yeah, there's going to be a bunch of these uh, updates. Sorry, this is the um, <laughs> this is the game of the year edition. However, for the first episode, we will be going through the prison gates. I'm, you'll notice I'm walking. Uh, we're going to be power leveling here, and uh, acrobatics and athletics are going to be put on hold, uh, at least for a while. Don't worry. Around level two or three, we'll start doing that, and and movement will become less tedious but for now we're just going to get out of the prison uh probably level up a few skills on the way and it, time permitting we will begin the arduous process of purchasing our home in the mountains and joining the mages guild tonight's topic is the third story in the clarence series entitled all muggers are martians this is from issue three of uh, u.s militia Ten Martian recruiting centers had been turned into infernos. There was little else in the news. Clarence watched the accounts hour after hour as the body count rose to 732. The police boasted several leads and promised to bring the homophobic monsters to justice. It was with great satisfaction that Clarence turned off the TV and took a walk down the street of his seedy neighborhood. As he listened to his guides praising him for his fine work, he didn't notice the three young black males crossing the street to intercept him. Clarence swerved to walk around them, but they blocked his path. We want your money, sucker, said one. Clarence was astonished as he had never had trouble with blacks. He refused to give them anything. One lashed out with a bald fist to his stomach. As he bent over, another slammed a fist into the side of his head. When he hit the sidewalk, all three began to kick and punch until Clarence could offer no resistance. When they searched him, they found only six dollars. You dumb mother, screamed one, only six dollars? You took a beating like that for six lousy bucks? Half conscious, Clarence replied groggily, I thought you were after the two hundred dollars in my shoe. As he limped back to his room, Clarence talked over the mugging with his guides. It was obvious that the mugging was no coincidence. They had to be Martians. That they were assuming the forms of blacks caused Clarence to remember Josh, his black friend and almost father, back at the hospital. Josh was the only one besides himself who knew of the Martian invasion. 
He had spent many happy hours with Josh as the elderly black leafed through a Rorschach inkblot book he had carried away with him after his last session with his psychiatrist. Josh believed it to be his own family photo album. Now here's me and the missus at the beach last summer. Clarence humored him as Josh would identify another inkblot as his youngest girl. Clarence knew that one was no little girl. It was plain to Clarence that it was actually a Martian eating an ice cream cone. But he never let on to Josh. Since Clarence had attracted Martian muggers, his guide suggested he make it a habit. He would rid the black community of Martians. He would do it for Josh. When he got back to his room, he fed the cat and went to bed. Next morning, he was sore and broke. Luckily, he had bought several cans of Sheba for the cat and some canned food for himself. They would have to go without milk, though. Even so, his next SSI check was over two weeks away, so he'd have to get some money. Well, Martian muggers would have all the money he needed. But right now, he had no weapons and no money to buy the makings. He did have about an ounce of super strong ammonia distilled from store ammonia. See page 18 which he had sucked up into a Vicks nasal inhaler. This was a devastating weapon. A shot in the face would instantly put anyone out of action for at least five minutes. That would come in handy, but he wanted something to hit with. He walked down the block to a garage and service station and went around back. After a few minutes of searching the ground, he found a lug nut. When he got back to his room, he rummaged through his equipment and found a foot-long piece of half-inch dowel and cut it in half. He next sawed a half-inch slit down the middle of one end. Then he forced the end of a length of heavy cord into the slit, wound it around several times, drew it under one of the strands, and tightened it. He then tied the lug nut six inches from the dowel. He had to rest and heal another day before he could go hunting, so he spent the time practicing. He had secured a pillow head high on the open closet door. With the lug nut and the dowel in his shirt pocket, he would face the pillow, grasp the protruding dowel, and flick the lug nut out at the pillow. After a few hours of practice, he could hit any point on the pillow within an inch. He could reach for the dowel and strike in less than a second. He was ready. He rested up all that day and the next. Then, after sundown, he went hunting. He hoped to meet the three Martians who had mugged him, but that was hardly likely. About ten blocks into the darker section of his neighborhood, he was confronted by two blacks who were almost businesslike. The one on his right had a pistol, and the other showed Clarence a knife. After the usual demand, Clarence said to the gunman, Who should I give the money to? This other guy looks like a criminal. I wouldn't trust him if I were you. As he said this, the gunman glanced at his partner, grinning at such stupidity. As he did as expected, Clarence snatched a dowel and in one swift movement swung the lug nut at the gunman's temple. It half buried itself in his skull and he buckled. Even as he swung, Clarence had the opened inhaler in his left hand and sprayed the knife man full in the face. The knife dropped and the blinded, agonized mugger whirled around screaming. Clarence picked up the pistol and shot him to end his misery. He then searched both muggers and collected $184.63. As he walked away, he said to his guide, Get back to Josh and tell him there are two less Martians masquerading as his people. Clarence decided to call it a night, as he was still stiff and sore from the beating. He went back to his room and bought more milk for the cat along the way. In his room, he examined the pistol and found it had only four bullets. That would be a problem. There was no way he could buy bullets in New York, at least not for a pistol. He would have to find a source or make a shotgun, since he knew he could buy shotgun shells. The next night, he walked about 20 blocks before he saw what might be Martians. Two blacks were dragging a young woman into a doorway near a bus stop. They hadn't seen Clarence. The young woman had screamed once, but then further screams were muffled. Clarence drew his gun and rushed to the doorway. The men were in the act of pulling her skirt off when Clarence appeared and shot one. The black holding her put his arm around her throat and pointed a pistol at her head. Then he said to Clarence, Throw down that gun and get out of here or I'll kill you. Clarence couldn't help laughing. Why, you must be catatonic. Your gun is pointed at her, so I'd have you shot before you could point it at me. Drop the gun right now or I'll kill you. 
If you shoot, you'll hit her, argued her captor, ducking his head behind the head of the young woman. If I shoot her, you can't very well use her as a shield, said Clarence, so drop the gun. I'm busy. The black seemed to think a moment, then dropped the gun, let loose of the young woman, and started to walk away. Clarence shot him in the face. The young woman began to blubber, and Clarence told her to shut up and get dressed as he searched both of the bodies. When he had taken their wallets and the pistol, he led the young woman back to the bus stop. He asked her why she was in this neighborhood, and she said she'd fallen asleep and gone past her stop. As he put her on the bus going back, she asked, Who are you? What's your name? Clarence as answered, I'm just a soldier in the Army of the Unseen, miss. We don't have names. When he got back to his room, he opened the wallets and found he had earned $137. He decided that killing Martian muggers could turn into a good living. He next came upon an ID card issued to New Yorkers who didn't drive. This had belonged to the one with the gun. Unlike the first gun, which was an automatic, the gun he took from the rapist was a 38 police special with five bullets. Clarence liked the 38 better, and one of his guides gave him an idea of how he could get more bullets. He would go to the address on the ID and get the bullets the owner must have had more of. It was bold, but he might flush out yet another nest of Martians. The next evening, he took a bus and got off near the address. He found the tenement building and walked up the three flights of stairs. When he got to the apartment number, he knocked. The door was opened by a surly teenager who looked like a mugger himself but didn't seem to be a Martian. The lad was about to slam the door in Clarence's face, but Clarence forced it open. Who are you, honky? You a cop? shouted the boy. No, said Clarence, pointing his pistol at the boy's face. I came here to get the bullets for this gun. I have enough to finish you and anyone in this place, so don't get cute. The boy backed up and led Clarence into a room at the back of the apartment. It was a bedroom with stacks of unopened TV and VCR cartons along the walls. It all looked like loot to Clarence, and he watched closely as the boy rummaged through dressers and found a box of 38 cartridges. The boy was obviously obeying out of fright, but as he handed Clarence the box, he examined the gun. That's Johnny's gun, he said. The only way you could have gotten that and to know to come here was to kill Johnny. Then he yelled, There's a whitey here with Johnny's gun. He's killed Johnny. A scream echoed from the next room, and a large female lumbered down the hall to the bedroom as Clarence made his way to the door. She blocked his way, and the boy, emboldened by rage and grief at the loss of his brother, slid around his mother and blocked the door. You killed my boy, she roared. You killed my boy. The lad then yelled, Get the butcher knife, Mama. Cut this honky to bits. The woman turned and rushed into the kitchen as Clarence tried to force his way past the boy to get at the door. Before he could get out, the woman charged with the knife in front of her, meaning to impale Clarence with the force of her large body as she continued to bellow, You killed my boy! You killed my boy! Clarence had no hope of disarming her. Almost on reflex, he grabbed the boy and spun around with him, and the woman buried the knife in her son's chest. With all the screaming and yelling from both mother and son, Clarence was able to open the door and flee down the hall. As he left the building, he answered one of his guides. Yes, they're a noisy people, but what's worse, they hold a grudge. He had dropped the box of bullets at the door and was in a foul mood. He blamed the botched mission on his guides. As he walked to the bus line, he told them, It's all your fault. You came up with that stupid plan. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Besides, they weren't even Martians. Simple rapists and thieves. Our only haul in two nights and I lost the bullets, and there's only five left in this gun. He continued to argue as he boarded the bus. Although he lo lowered his voice, his muttering caused the other passengers to stare as he was the only white person on the bus. He stared back, and as he did so, he noticed three men a few seats behind him. They were the ones who had mugged him. It was no coincidence. They were following him. They must have known what he had just done. He'd have to get rid of them. He stared straight at them, and they recognized him. He kept staring until he neared his stop. Then, continuing to stare over his shoulder, he went toward the front exit. One of the muggers nudged the other, and the three got up and waited at the middle exit, as Clarence expected. When they all got off the bus, Clarence hurried down the street. They thought he was trying to get away, but he only wanted to get away from the well-lighted main street. 
The muggers hurried also, and when they caught up to him, one said, Hey, mother, you got another $200 in your shoe? The three laughed and then stopped laughing when Clarence spun around and pointed his pistol. Their leader said, No fair, mister, we ain't armed. Clarence calmly and quickly put a round into each chest and sent the last two into the heads of the two st still flopping. He quickly took their wallets and left the pistol in the hand of one. Back at his room, he counted the money from the wallets. He had earned $362, actually counting the $200 he had lost to them, only $162. But those were the breaks. One thing he resolved was to drop his dependence on Smith and Wesson. He'd make his own guns from now on. He decided on an improvised shotgun. See page 11. Cheap, no ballistic, simple parts and ammunition, easy to get without signing, at least outside New York City. He had been reading gun magazines and knew that single-lot buckshot shells held 16 30 caliber pellets, the most destructive load available to civilians. Next day, he went to a large hardware store and bought six feet of one-inch steel plumbing pipe and had it cut into six-inch lengths, each piece threaded well at one end. The clerk, just out of curiosity, asked what he wanted it for. Clarence answered that he didn't know as he was getting it for his landlord. He then bought 12 one-inch pipe caps and two six-foot lengths of three-quarter-inch pipe. When he had lugged the hardware and the remaining odds and ends up to his room, he set about sawing the three-quarter inch pipes into ten-inch lengths. After he had made twelve guns, he took the Metro to Brewster. He went into a sporting goods store and asked the clerk where the nearest shooting range was so he could practice with his shotgun. The clerk gave him a location and Clarence asked for eight boxes of single-aught buckshot. He presented his state ID card, but the clerk wasn't interested. That evening, he felt the need to test the gun. There was a basement in the apartment building, but he didn't want to attract attention with the noise. What with backfires and shootings being common in the neighborhood, he decided to test the gun around the corner. When he got to the darker part of the street, Clarence put the pipe cap against his stomach and slammed the barrel back. The shell exploded, and the recoil nearly knocked him down and certainly knocked the wind out of him. That was no good. Had he been holding the six-inch pipe in one hand, he wouldn't have been able to keep his grip. Nor could he risk staggering around trying to regain his breath. He had to make something to absorb the recoil. Also, the heat from the shell came up through the handle and burned his hand. Not enough to blister, but it did hurt. Moreover, it would leave powder flecks on his right hand. There was little chance of his being tested for firing a gun, but he had better solve those problems. He had looked around the basement while he and his guides talked over the testing. He remembered some old sponge rubber mattresses in one corner. He went down and cut a square foot from one, along with an odd piece of quarter-inch plywood, and took them up to his room. He cut an eight-by-eight-inch square from the plywood and rounded its corners. He then cut the piece of mattress to the same size. He used goop to glue on the plywood and now had a four and a half inch thick pad with a plywood rest to absorb the recoil. Next he cut a four inch square by one inch thick piece of mattress and made a slit in its middle. This he slipped over the barrel to absorb any heat and powder specks coming up through the handle. He made three more as spares. Clarence spent the next day feeding the cat, watching TV, and practicing loading, drawing, stripping off the duct tape, dry firing with a spent shell, and disassembling the shotgun. He got so he could fire, disassemble, and throw the pieces in all directions in under 10 seconds, just in case a patrol car should come into view. That night, he put the pad plywood side out inside his jacket over his stomach. It gave him a bit of a pot belly, but it wasn't too noticeable. He had cut a pocket-sized slit in the jacket a few inches to the right of the zipper. Through this slit, he pushed one of the guns and lodged it at the top of the pad. He put one gun in each of his pants pockets and another into his right jacket pocket. He had lengthened to keep it out of sight. He also put a dozen shells into his left jacket pocket. Then the one-man army went out into the dark street hunting for Martians. He walked 15 blocks, floating on air despite the weight. He was so happy that he had the perfect we weapon to rid the planet of at least 199 of them. 
but of course he could go back to Brewster and get eight Let's more boxes. As he was fantasizing thusly, three blacks turned the corner and nearly bumped into him. They could have gone around but stopped and barred his way. Clarence looked up and down the street and one of the blacks said, No use, man. There's no cops anywhere around. This is our hood, baby, said a second. Clarence was looking for cops but was relieved not to see any and was glad of the black's reassurance. The third black pulled a gun and held it sideways, taunting Clarence. Now this here's a 45 caliber automatic. It's for killing white fools who come into our hood and don't turn over their money fast. And maybe if they do turn it over, what do you think, fool? Well, said Clarence, drawing his own through the slit in his jacket, I don't think a forty-five caliber bullet compares with a 12-gauge single aught with 1630 caliber pellets. The black took a moment to examine the weapon as Clarence pulled off the strip of duct tape, pulled the barrel out an inch, and slammed it back. It went off with a roar and a flash pointed at the man's chin. It turned his face to hamburger, and he vaulted back as if hit by a sledgehammer. Before the other two could react, Clarence changed his grip on the barrel, jerked it out of the handle, and smashed it into the temple of one. The third mugger took off, and Clarence dropped the pieces and went for the gun in his right pocket. He rested the handle on his front again, took aim, and slammed the barrel home. The last mugger was 35 yards away when at least six of the 16 pellets ripped into the back of his head and body. He went down on his face and twitched as Clarence took the wallets from the two nearest and picked up the pieces of the first gun. Then he loped to the first mugger, took his wallet, and went down the an alley to relax and reload. As he replaced the shells and put on two more strips of duct tape, which he had stuck to the plywood on his padding, he marveled at the gun's performance. It was quick and devastating, and the pad had absorbed the recoil. It was ever so much better than any gun he had taken. He hadn't even bothered to pick up the forty-five. So much for trashy weapons. With four guns back in place, Clarence continued deeper into the ghetto. Ordinarily, this would not have been the best hunting ground for muggers, as they would be working better neighborhoods. But neither Clarence nor his guides were wise enough to know this. Even so, a young pot-bellied white man was a good target for muggers on their way to work. As Clarence walked along, he noticed a young white man coming his way. The fellow had long hair, an earring, a beard, and wore jeans torn at the knees, a real scuzz bag. Even so, Clarence thought it best to warn him. Say, mister, he said as the man neared, this is the wrong neighborhood for whites. There are muggers around here. The scuzz bag stopped about a yard from Clarence. That's okay, he said. I mug niggers. You what? asked Clarence, astonished. I mug niggers, he repeated. Of course, I ain't prejudiced. I mug whites, too, and spicks. As a matter of fact, I'm mugging you, so hand over your wallet. The scuzz bag snapped open a switchblade and waved it under Clarence's nose. The white mugger didn't look like a Martian, but then again, who did? Clarence pulled a gun from his jacket, stripped off the duct tape, and blew the surprised scuzz bag's face away. It was nearly mud midnight, and Clarence decided to ride back to his room. He walked four blocks to a thoroughfare and boarded a nearly empty bus. A block later, two blacks got on and sat in the seats in front of Clarence. As they rode, they talked openly about going to Central Park, where the pickings were easy. Clarence listened as his guides mapped out a new program for him. Instead of using him as bait, they would let him interrupt muggings. Clarence liked the idea. He was tired but excited at the prospect of actively protecting people from Martians. He rode with the two muggers until they changed buses. He changed with them and they didn't seem to notice. The two got off at Central Park and Clarence got off a block further. He noticed which path they took and b doubled back to follow them. The park was nearly deserted at this time of night but two tourists so stupid as to be asking for it, were about to get it. Clarence saw the two waylay the tourists and draw guns. He left the path and sprinted toward them behind a line of bushes. As the man was handing over his wallet and the woman was emptying her purse, Clarence quickly stripped the duct tape from two guns. He shot through the bushes, downing one of the muggers, and quickly picked up the other gun. The blast of the shotgun shell rang through the area. The remaining mugger looked all over for its origin, not knowing where to shoot or where to run. The woman tourist clung to her husband and, as they were out of the line of fire, 
Clarence fired again, nearly cutting the other mugger in half. As the tourist stood frozen in shock, Clarence commanded through the bushes, Get out of the park right now. Go. The tourist came back to life, and the husband dragged his wife toward the exit, leaving one of her shoes behind. Clarence came out of the bushes and lifted the wallets of the muggers. Clarence quickly reloaded and left the park, never getting back on a path. Rather than wait around for a bus, he went down the subway stairs. He got on the first train and walked through the nearly empty cars until he came to the last one. He sat down and looked out the window at the street signs illuminated on the sides of the tunnel. He was going the wrong way, but he didn't worry. Seeing him sitting alone, two more muggers cruising the cars approached him. Clarence slipped the gun from the slit in his jacket. As the lead mugger flashed his knife, Clarence's gun flashed and the mugger's insides made a mess of that end of the car. Clarence leaped up with the barrel and smashed it into the head of the other mugger. He then lifted their wallets, fat from the night's take. There were no witnesses as the last car was empty. Despite the noise, the rattle of the subway train kept the few passengers in the other cars from hearing it. Clarence got off at the next stop. From there, Clarence made his way to his room, fed the cat, and watched TV through the night. The media was already picking up the stories of people being shotgunned over a wide area. That the victims were muggers, there was no doubt, even without positive IDs. As yet, there was no media panic, since only eight muggers had been killed that night. There was no mention of the two muggers and two rapists he had taken care of two nights ago. Clarence counted his money and found he had more than $1,000, so he decided to stop taking wallets. The next evening, he went cruising again and got six more. Eight the next Welcome evening and only body. three the next. After a week, enough way. bodies of muggers were turning up in subways, parks, and side str streets to finally alarm the media. The media, in turn, alarmed the muggers. Clarence had slimmer pickings from then on. Fewer muggers mugging made for a boring routine. Clarence would have there. to find different targets. He opened another can of Sheba for the cat and turned That's on his fair. trusty little TV. A good He's made now, you and your friends could listen to the Kurt Saxon Show on a digital programmable shortwave radio for only $49.95. The AC-101 has the following features, PLL synthesized tuning, frequency range of 2.3 to 6.2 megahertz, and 7.1 to 21.85 megahertz continuous. AM and FM, record timer, 20 station presets, external antenna jack, 65-page program guide, sleep timer, two-year warranty, plus much more. Send check or money order to EIS PO Box 2415 KS, Youngstown, Ohio 44509. Or for credit card orders only, 1 800 456 8770. That's 1 800 456 8770. For information, send a self addressed stamp envelope to EIS PO Box 2415 KS, Youngstown, Ohio 44509. All orders are shipped out within one week, and if you order now from Kurt Show, you will receive a free AC adapter worth over $12. Thank you. Okay, here I am again, and I think that uh, that lamp is a great thing to buy. Oh, uh, hey, I uh, carry just I wasn't listening. Well, the radio is a great thing to buy, too. Yeah, we, we've got one, and it's uh, pretty good. So uh, I'm waiting for calls now. The phone number is 501-437-2963. The mailing address is P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. And uh, if you'll send in $1, refundable on your first order, you'll get a catalog describing all my books and tapes. And incidentally, uh, this... Uh, frequency has not been picked up too well, so I'm going to go on uh, at 7 o'clock from now on, uh, starting Monday. Hello, Kurt here. Hello, this is Kurt? Yeah. Where are you calling from? Oh, Connecticut. Connecticut. Uh, did, are you picking me up pretty clear there? Oh, Kurt. it's on a delay. Yeah, it's on a delay. Turn off your radio or turn it down so you can't hear it, because it just confused you. Oh, I'm surprised to get you. Yeah, it's Steve from Connecticut. You're coming in pretty bad tonight. You were a lot better last night. Yeah, well, uh, I'll be going on uh, at 7 o'clock starting Monday. Yeah. Now, that'll be 8 o'clock your time. That's right. Yeah, I just heard that. I'm, 
I don't know if I'll be able to pick you up then, because I'll be working. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> same frequency, though, huh? See, those, those, well, it's the same frequency, but that's the best they could do. They realized there was a problem with this time. Yeah. Well, the main reason I called is about uh, Clarence. He's coming in pretty good. I like him. Yeah. But uh, last night you had him uh, making those uh, drinking straw igniters. Yeah. The bombs. Yeah. Now, he was using uh, cotton and sawdust. Yeah. And you were, uh, I got one of your old uh, James Bond books. Yeah. And you were saying that you shouldn't use cotton in there because the sulfuric acid would, uh, might heat up and melt the straw. Well, uh, you, you don't put enough uh, cotton in there. See, all the cotton is for is just to hold the sawdust away from the sulfuric acid. But if you put a lot of cotton in there, then it would cause heat and would melt, melt the straw. But it's just a little bit of cotton, just a pinch. Well, if you subscribe to U.S. Militia, then you can study the process. Because all I'm doing is reading it. Uh, in order to do those things, if you feel the need to, then uh, you have to be having it in front of you. Not, I couldn't tell you how to do it. You've you, you got to be reading it and then looking at the diagrams. And it's, well, yes, I did test it. Uh, yes, well, I got one of your old James Bonds. Well, I know, but you see, the old James Bond is right for the process there. But this is a different... Uh, device entirely. Oh, I guess so. It's just that the, uh, you said not to use cotton then. Well, I know, but there's no law against using cotton. <laughs> the idea is that you don't use cotton as a delay. Uh -huh. You use cotton simply to separate the, uh, uh, so, so the sawdust doesn't fall down into the uh, 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 sulfuric acid. Oh, well, you see, if you had the if if you had a subscription to uh, U.S. Militia, you would see the diagram, and it would it'd be self-explanatory. Okay, well, I just look at the diagram here. I got the book open to the page yeah, right I now. I know, I know, but you see that, like I said, yeah. uh, in in the book, you're not supposed to use cotton as a delay, but in this process, the cotton isn't being used as a delay. Well, then how, uh, then what is the cotton for then? I don't understand well, like that. I said, you see, you, you've got to read the story for yourself, so you've got to subscribe. I but see. the cotton is simply to, uh, it, it sticks in the tube, you pour the uh, uh, sawdust in there, and the, the, the cotton simply keeps the sawdust from going down into the sulfuric acid. It's not a delay, and there's not enough uh, cotton in there to cause any heat. Oh, I see. Could you tell me what the sawdust is for? The, the sawdust is for the delay. See, it takes uh, about a minute to a minute and a half for the sulfuric acid to go through the sawdust and hit the uh, powder from the match head. Yeah, but that would seem to have the same problem as the cotton. You said don't use any organic barriers. Or well, any I know, but you see, it, the uh, cotton... Uh, is used up immediately. Yeah, but I'm talking See, about uh, sawdust uh, now. The, the sawdust, uh, it's... For, okay, I don't know how to explain it to you. You'd have to have the U.S. militia in front of you and read it for yourself, but I've tested it many, many times, and it works. Okay. So don't worry about it. Are you a subscriber to U.S. Militia? No, I just bought this book years ago. Yeah, well, okay. That's what I thought when I was out buying those type of books. Yeah, well, probably you you don't have the new improved Poor Man James Bond album. Oh, no, this is uh, 70, the copyright 72. So. Yeah, well, it, it was copyrighted. That, that was the original, but it's gone through many editions since, many improvements. I'm sure it has. See, I, haven't, I just found you about two months ago on the radio or so. Yeah. So, you know, I got back interested in this stuff again. Well, we'll get you well-educated, but you ought to subscribe to U.S. Militia. It's only $35. You start out with the first four issues, and you get the rest as they come out. Now, also, subscribing to U.S. Militia gives you 10% off on all my books and tapes. Yeah, it sounds good. I've heard, that before. I've heard you say that before. Yeah. Uh, one more quick question. Okay. You say how you've uh, bought other books on uh, different subjects, and you always figure yours is the best. 
how uh, do you test everything you uh, write about? Uh, how does it work? Everything that I write about, I test. I can't test everything that the uh, see uh, the poor man's James Bond series is a compilation of many, many books, and uh, I test what I write. In, in, in the uh, poor man James Bond, but I can't test what the writers of the other books did. However, you see, most of those other books were printed 50 and 100 years ago when people had to know what they were writing about before they could get published. The modern stuff you buy now from Paladin and Lumpanix and Desert Delta and people like that. They just hire idiots to fantasize and hack out garbage that looks good to suckers but they don't care whether it works or not. Once they got your money, what are you going to do? Say, I tried to build a bomb and it didn't work? <laughs> yeah, but everything should be pretty safe in here. Well, in, in the poor man's James Bond and U.S. militia, it's safe because I do test it. Uh, the, the other books, uh, they don't test. No, I mean everything in your James Bond book, you've tested yourself, so you know it's safe and it if works. I wrote it, if I wrote it, I tested it. Okay. Well, I didn't know if you wrote every single uh, yeah, but you see, thing in here. 30, 50, 100 years ago, you couldn't write something and get it published unless it was accurate because the people who read it uh, before they printed it would know. But nowadays, uh, you buy books along that line, and they're just a lot of fantasy. They don't work. They're silly. And you could get in real trouble if you uh, try to use them, and you're even in worse trouble if you set them aside until the day comes, and then you think you're going to depend on them. It could cost you your life because they don't work. Yeah, I know. I've been thinking about that since I read your book. I was just wondering how you would test them out. Well, I think, well, see, it, it also, uh, if you had been listening carefully, uh, okay. I didn't know how to read simply the story without telling how he did these things. But you've got to have the diagrams in front of you, which are in the, the U.S. Well, militia, and you've got to have, uh, you. well, you've got to be I reading it for yourself and do it step by step. Yeah, I see. I'll have to follow the instructions then. Yes. When all else fails, follow the instructions. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. Yes. I guess that's it then. Okay, look, thanks for calling. Call me again in next week. No, I'm glad to get in touch with you because I tried last night just after you read that, that second one and yeah. I could get in contact with you. Well, we had a dead space there, but sometimes people can't get in touch. Well, you just, all you can do is try. I'm here. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what's the time again Monday? Uh, 7 o'clock. Central time. Yeah. That would be 8 o'clock your time. Right, 8 to 9 my time. Same yeah. frequency. Yes. Okay, thanks a lot, Kurt. You're very welcome. Should be getting my money order pretty soon. Okay. I'm listening to the radio. It sounds real good. I'll have to send out for the catalog and see what else you got. Okay, it's, you're, you're going to love it. Well, I'm sure I will. I love these uh, prayer stories and all your other uh, ideas and information. Yeah. Okay, then. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye, bye for now. Yep. Bye. <clears throat> okay, again, the phone number is 501-437-2963. The mailing address is P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. Send in $1.00. Refundable on your first order, and you'll get a catalog describing all my books and tapes and U.S. militia. Of course, I've been reading uh, the stories of Clarence from U.S. militia, and tomorrow is the fourth story of Clarence, and you mustn't take these stories too seriously. You see, Clarence is crazy as a bed bug. Uh, you, you'd have to be nuts to do what Clarence does. But, of course, you ought to have the same kind of attitude. You see, Clarence isn't timid. He's not fearful of anything. And when I was a bum and uh, messed around on the right wings uh, in the 60s, I wasn't afraid of anything either. But just don't blow up anybody until uh, Edgar it's all right, until there's no law to, stop, to, to grab you. Hello, you Kurt here. You know, I've been listening to you off and on. Lawrence! It's yes. been so long, buddy. Why haven't you called sooner? Well, the propagation on the station has been kind of... It's um, been awful. Well, let's just hope that it's better for you starting Monday. We hope so. What time? What's your schedule? It's 7 o'clock Central. What, wh what state are you calling from? I'm calling from Mississippi. Mississippi. Well, it should be... Oh, oh what, what's the frequency? 7435. Uh, okay. And you won't come on at night? 
Well, I mean, you won't come on at ten, at ten Central anymore. No, because it's just uh, not getting out to the public. Okay. Well, you know, to get back uh, to what I was going to state, it seems as though you've been talking about that the IQ of the average person has fallen. Yes. And basically, that you want to offer offer people these books. Yeah. Them survive this this uh this crash. Yeah. This uh, disintegration. Yeah. Of this Western civilization. Yes. Well, let me ask you a question. If this Western civilization, which uh, I don't doubt is not going to disintegrate because I can see it now, if the Western world is coming to an end, what good are your books going to do in a total collapse? Well, they will help the intelligent ones to survive while the rest of them die. Do you have, are, are they any intelligent? Oh, yes. Well, now, wait a minute. I'm intelligent. Now. Carrie's intelligent. You're smart as a whip, Lawrence, I can tell. If you had a set of my books, you could save your loved ones and be of use to your neighbors so that your little community could be like a, a safe island in the midst of the chaos. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, if the IQ of the, of, of, the, of the average person in this country has gone down so low... Yeah. And basically, they and you talk about people including in the government, right? Well, not so much. You see, it's the low IQ people who put those stupid people in the government, but it's not so much that the people in the government are stupid. It's just that they're crafty and sly and they're con artists and they con the general ignorant public into thinking that they're going to give them something else for nothing. Right. Now, this you just made my, you just got to the point that I'm looking at. That's right. When I listen to uh, Chuck Carter and I listen to uh, uh, Tom Valentine and so on, mm -hmm. and I'm black, and, you know, people, this, this nation here is only about 200 and maybe, what, 20 years old? Yeah. A little bit older. Uh, it seems as though that uh, in this short period of time, and this is not very long, 200 and some odd years, that's right. It seems as though that uh, when I trace where the Anglo's come from out of England, and I've done research on the history, mm -hmm. most of the pilgrims and everybody that that the that the, that the people put out, they claim that they were seeking freedom, right? From well, that's usually journey. what they say, but yeah. they're on the make. They want to see how much cash they can get and how many Indians they can take it from. Well, no, I'm talking about the the so-called the so-called pilgrims that come over here. Well, that's what they were, pilgrims. Right. Well, it seemed to me, now, my research shows that these were just people that the uh, the British Empire didn't want inside their country. You're right, for the most part. And that basically most of the people were rapists and... Well, not necessarily <laughs> rapists. They were they were murderers and they were, you know, when you start... No, 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 you're wrong right there. Now. Wait, 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 they Lawrence, don't Lawrence, don't hey, call. Lawrence, let, let, let me, you, you see, you're going off on a tangent. Now, my ancestor was a prisoner in uh, England, and he was sold out of Newgate Prison as a white slave uh -huh. to serve seven years over here. Now, the, the, the murderers, the rapists, well, not many murderers or rapists. See, that was, those were crimes punishable by death. These were just mentally sick people that went down. Not necessarily. They were people that uh, dropped through the cracks. And, uh, the British didn't want them. Wait, of course, that's right. You're right. They didn't want them. But you see, the pilgrims came over here with a religious idea. They weren't, crim they weren't part of the criminal class. See, so get your, your groups uh, in order. Well, did, let me ask you this. The, the, the Great Britain didn't feel any loss by the pilgrims coming over here, did they? They didn't what? The, the British didn't feel any loss with the pilgrims. They didn't cry with Of the course not. Would okay, you care if a bunch of religious fanatics left your community? Pardon? Would you care if a bunch of religious fanatics left your community? No. All right, so then neither did the British. All right, now let's get to this point here. Now, George Washington was a British general, right? No, he was an American general. Well, he came from Great Britain, though. No, he was born in the United States. Oh, was he? Yes, in the I colonies. I thought he was a British general. No, he was, a, he was an American. It was Cornwallis that was the British general. Okay, then. Now, when, we, when I look at this whole scenario of America and listen to these, these conspir cons conspiratorial uh, talk shows... Yeah, well, they're all liars. It seems to me that the average uh, Anglo-Saxon in this country can be manipulated very easy. Well, that's what I'm here to stop. 
And it seems to me that the people that have been leading this country for the last 200 and some odd years have just virtually taken the masses of the Anglos on down the drain. Well, actually, not for the last 200 years, for the last 30, 40 years. After World War II. Yeah, after World War II. Fifty years are born. Okay, I'll give you that. All right, now, if, if in that shorter period of time, when you look at all the rest of these empires, like Great Britain, how long it lasted, mm -hmm. German Empire, all over in Western Europe, here you got America only about 200 and some odd years old and really became a power after World War II, a real economic, I mean, military power. Yeah. When they dropped the nuclear bomb on, on the Japanese. Yeah. And at that point, it started declining. Well, it tells me then that the people here that have been running this country aren't fit to, aren't fit to run the country. Well, you're right. They don't need the country. You're right. I think basically then, if, uh, are you for justice? Well, isn't everybody? And if oh. I wasn't, if are I you was a liar, me? wouldn't I say it was for justice anyway? Are you for justice? Okay, I'll, I'll give you Are that. Are you for yes, justice yes, and equality? I'm for justice. Why don't you just basically, I think what would be fair, and it's going to happen anyhow because of the cosmological forces that's working against this country, I think it would be only fair to just give it back to the Indians. Well, the, the Indians and, and, and the Anglos get And go back to England. No, I wouldn't want to live in England. I like to, they got a big bookstore in London that I'd like to visit, but as far as uh, well, you know, England's on the decline. It's a socialist state. It, it's well, of it's course, being respected in hey, it. Hey, Lawrence, I've been telling y'all on this program since I got on that every system on the whole planet, aside from Singapore, is on decline. Uh -huh. See, it's because of uh, overpopulation and downbreeding. The IQ is going down, and the numbers of worthless well, is people that why, are going up. Let me ask you this: Is that why then that the, is is the reason? Well, let me ask you: Since IQs on the decline, yes, you mean among the white folks? Among everybody? No, because if you got one group of people beginning to dominate the world in math and engineering and science, their IQs are not going down. Well, I know, but they the, the no, they can't. Okay, uh, take down. a hundred you people. You dominate in banking, Lawrence. Lawrence, you take a hundred people. Uh huh. Now, uh, fifty years ago, about fifty of those people would have been competent. Today, only about ten per uh, ten of those people are competent. Well, now you can only speak for white folks. I'm speaking for everybody. Oh, you can't Look, speak for everybody. Okay, I, I will whether you like it or not. Well, now, let me Listen, ask you Lawrence, I love you like a brother, but you've taken up uh, a certain amount of time, so I want you to call again next week. Will you do that? I'll think about it. Oh, you pre I appreciate it. All right. Good night. Okay, again, the phone number is 501-437-2963. The mailing address is P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. Oh, uh, now we're going to do the lamp commercial. It's a fine lamp. The test of time is possibly the greatest testimonial to a product or company's greatness. And for 86 years, Mr. Victor Samuel Johnson's amazing invention continues its legacy. The Aladdin incandescent kerosene mantle lamp has been lighting American homes for three generations. In rural farmlands of America, they were the constant source of dependable and economical everyday lighting. The magic to the Aladdin lamp is the mantle that incandesces like an electric light while using no electricity. You can have dependable economical lighting for the future without depending on any utility company. At 98% efficiency, they burn odorless with the equivalency of over 36 candles, while fuel costs are less than what you'd spend on a single candle. They start pricing at under $40. Send $1 to receive an information packet. Send it to Modern Solutions Incorporated, 1325 West Main Street, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. Your dollar will be credited on any purchase. 
That address again is Modern Solutions Incorporated, 1325 West Main Street, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. You can be sure you'll enjoy reading your Survivor series no matter what befalls your electric company. How often are you on? Okay, now I am on, uh, we got a caller, Jim from New Brunswick. Uh, I am on five nights a week, weeknights that is, and I've been on uh, starting at 10 o'clock Central, and as of Monday I will be on uh, starting 7 o'clock Central on this same frequency because we figured that we, we should get better reception at an earlier time. Oh, that's great. That's a real good program. How long is your program? An hour? Half? One hour. One hour. And I usually give a little talk. Uh, well, right now I'm reading the stories about Clarence, the psychotic murderer who everyone loves uh, from U.S. militia. Oh, yeah. Yes. Great. Oh, that's really good. But it's, uh, we're, we're, it's quarter to one here where I live. It's quarter to one in the morning. Is that Canada? Yes, New Brunswick, Canada, up yes. Maine, Maine, Quebec, Prince Edward Island, and Nova Scotia. Yes, I figured it was Canada, but you don't say eh. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can if you want me to. No, uh, you're really, a, it's an enjoyable program. I listen on shortwave every night. I listen on 7435 and 5810 and 7315. Yeah. But uh, I really, uh, I was to your program just a few minutes ago, and I thought it was a really good one. It's uh, very, very good. Well, I, you I, didn't catch the first of it? That's a good no, I didn't, sir. I well, didn't. what I might do is uh, I'm, I'm tempted to start Monday with my editorial showing what an idiot Rush Limbaugh is. <laughs> and then uh, I might just repeat these four stories to finish out the week. And, of course, after I finish babbling, then I'll uh, open it to calls. Oh, that's great. I'm really because glad that so you're, you have a number that a per people can call. Like, I realize in the United States it's good to have 1-800 numbers, but there's a lot of programs that are on the radio that a person would like to call from outside of the country, but you can't call because the Zenith numbers don't work. Yeah, well, I'm glad yours does. Well, no, well, I mean, I, 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 we, we don't have a Zenith, you, you don't have a Zenith number, but it's very, very interesting, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call again if you don't mind. I would love it. Call every week. And you want to monitor things up here because we, we don't have too long, I don't think, to last in this country yeah. with, with the uh, Quebec situation. Well, it's like I told Lawrence, every system except Singapore is uh, going down the tubes. Yeah. I just heard about Singapore where they executed a Dutchman for uh, possession of dope. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, well, see, they, they got the right idea. Oh, I'm telling you. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah, we don't even have the we don't have the death penalty in Canada at all. Yeah, and I got I, I bet you have, have a lot of people who anymore. deserve it too. Pardon? I bet you have a lot of people who deserve it. Oh, you want to believe it? Oh, yes. Well, we got millions oh. here. I'd like to dump. And when we did have the death penalty, the House of Commons or the cabinet ministers would meet and they'd commute, the, uh, they'd commute it. So we haven't had an execution in Canada for, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 years probably. Well, that's, I, I bet you've had a lot of murders. Oh, yeah, it's not, it's not Por good. Not as much as we have. Well, we, uh, proportionally, we probably have the same thing. Yeah. Okay, then, you call again next week, and I hope you can hear me good at, at, uh, uh, at 9 o'clock your time in New Brunswick starting Monday. Okay. I enjoyed listening to the historical part there about George Washington. I'm a history buff myself. Well, was I right? I enjoyed the historical aspect uh, of, your, of your program, discussing things like that. Well, I love... Oh, I'm a historian, too. I collect books, especially... I really like Americana. I'm a, I, I have a law degree, but I, my hobby is uh, books and uh, movies and things like that. Anyway, I won't bother you anymore. Okay. Get, well, you, you ought to uh, order my catalog... Yes, because there's a lot, um, a lot of history in that. The history of how people did things. You oh, that it. sounds very interesting. Well, I'll listen to your program and I'll get your address and I'll write for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye for now. Okay, the phone number again is five zero one four three seven two nine six three. The mailing address is P.O. Box nine five Alpena, Arkansas seven two six one one. Send in one dollar. Refundable on your first order for the Atlan Formularies catalog. Just send to uh, Kurt Saxon, P.O. Box 95, Alpena, Arkansas, 72611. 
And I was talking to Adam Locke, the manager of the station today, and he told me that a fellow from Canada called him up and, and was care. very disturbed about Clarence's firebombs, and it seems that he believed that it was real, like uh, Orson Welles' uh, War of the Worlds in the 30s. Uh, no, that's a story. It's fiction. Don't worry about it. Hello, Kurt here. Oh, hey. Where are you calling from? Uh, Toledo, Ohio. Are you hearing me? Uh, I'm hearing you. Okay. Uh, one thing about your signal is there's some uh, Rio Tel type uh, interference that comes in and out. Well, maybe when I'm on at an earlier time, it will be better. I hope that's what uh, Adam said. He hoped too. Mm -hmm. Because you know, like I had to kind of like strain as you go in and out, <laughs> things like that. Well, that's that's more than I would do. I wouldn't strain to hear me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, what do you got to talk about? Oh, no, I just wanted to call and tell you that, uh, you know, I just picked your show up accidentally the other day on shortwave about four or five nights ago, and I've been religiously listening to you every day. Now. Well, it gets better all the time. I've been on eight months, and I'm having a lot of fun, except when people don't get the program, that that upsets me. Mm -hmm. So we've been sort of jockeying around. I got on uh, first... WWCR at 6 o'clock and I wanted a better time slot and they couldn't give me one and so I got on WRNO at 7 o'clock and that didn't have the coverage I was led to believe and so then I got back on WWCR at uh, 10 o'clock central and uh, that had rotten reception and uh, so now we're trying uh, an earlier time well, I know for a fact, uh, you know, uh, you come on 11 o'clock our time, from 9 to 11, I can barely hear the signal Yeah. up here, you know, on 7. Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope it's not bad for you then. It, 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 it might will. be true. It's amazing is how clear 5810 is. Well, that's... That. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, that's right. We'll be on between 8 and 9 your time. What is it? Mm -hmm. Does it come in fairly well? I, well, well I know the 9, nine o'clock show that comes on uh, is really very bad. I, can't, I can barely hear it. Well, it'll, uh, it, it'll come on at 8 o'clock. Okay, I hope that, you know, it's I better at that so. time. You say 5.810 comes in very good. Yeah, all evening, in fact. See, that's that's what I've been uh, sort of uh, talking about uh, with Adam, that if they're broadcasting uh, three transmitters, then each should do equally well. Uh, and a lot of people have told me that, uh, hey, 5.810 comes in so much better, and here I'm on... 7435, and uh, well, who knows, maybe somebody that's uh, on 5.810 will die, and I'll get their spot. Also, there's another problem, is you're not far away from the ham bands there, Yeah. and every now and then there's some local guy that, uh, I have a portable I listen to, you and that you know, causes me some interference and things like yeah. that, so it, it's not the most ideal location, I do admit. Well, also, if, if anyone would like to, they could buy these tapes from Terry for $6 a piece postpaid. And he would be glad to send anyone a list of them. Mm -hmm. And it's something to take to the shop and listen to or listen to while you're working around the house. See, now, the, 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 the tapes are perfect. The, the tapes aren't... If you get static over the air, that's one thing, but the tapes you would buy from Kerry for $6 a piece postpaid ahead, would please. be perfect. No, no distortion, no static, you nothing. It's okay. Well, I just wanted to tell you, I also called about seven or eight of my friends over the last couple of days and gave them your frequency and yeah. time and everything, and they're, gonna, they're listening to you too, so you're picking up some listenership. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, and then ne next week, I because of the bad reception, I think I'll do the whole uh, Clarence series again, because people like that. Uh, everybody loves Clarence, because he's a murderous psychotic. You have some pretty unique ideas, I have to agree with you. I've got a chemical engineering degree. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, I like some of the way you thought of some of these things. Well, Clarence thought of it. I had nothing uh, to do with it. Clarence thought of it, yeah. Yes. 
Okay, we got to sign off okay. now, and I hope you'll call again next week. Okay, bye. Okay, buddy, bye-bye. Now it's sign-off time. I'll talk to you tomorrow. So this is Kirk Saxon saying goodbye and be good. So, study the book, study the tape, and study your own attitudes and your own skill. Take stock of everything, because what we're messing with is more than dynamite. It could be your life.